Hey, if you're in the fourth or fifth grade, we'd like to dismiss you to your Bible study class. And so if you'll go down, uh, someone's down there ready to take you, fourth and fifth graders. I'd like to have kind of a pastoral conversation with you today, uh, rather than a, a regular teaching time per se, but we're going to look at a passage of scripture, so if you have your Bible, you might want to go ahead and open there to the New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 4, we're going to be looking together in verses 1 through 16. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew there, it's page 977. But I want to talk to you today about the table... And the chair. The table and the chair. Uh, let's begin with a table. And I'm going to use these as kind of a metaphor in a couple of ways. Someone asked me if this was a cocktail table. <laughs> now, being a good pastor, I don't know a lot about cocktail tables. But I like this table. It goes up and down. You can put your Bible, your notes on it. I, I use a, a computer, not because I'm techie, but because I like the big font. And so we just uh, can use it for that. And, and it doesn't have to be a cocktail table. It can, it can be used for coffee. And so I'd, I'd like my beautiful assistant to bring me a cup of coffee here. And uh, thank you. And we can not have a cocktail today right now, but just have a coffee instead. So, mm. Mm, good coffee. So, so we have the table. And um, to me... This table represents Pastor Zach's teaching because this is Pastor Zach's table. This is the table that he uses when he speaks. And so I really love and appreciate Pastor Zach, your teaching. Pastor Zach is a great teacher. He's biblical, which I think is so critical and important. And, and as he teaches, he teaches God's word. And he's, he's very clear. He's very passionate. He's very emotive in his teaching. Makes it very memorable, doesn't it? And he has his own unique style in speaking. It's, it's energetic, it's earnest, it's paced, it's very gesticular, you know. And, and I just love Zach's teaching and how he teaches. And then we have the chair. Several years ago, I began sitting in the chair when I teach. I hadn't always done that, but I've done that the last several years. I remember actually the first time I sat down in the chair intentionally for a teaching time. I was talking about the role of men and women. And when it came to the part of the passage where he was talking about the role of women, I, 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 you know, it's a, it's a, in our culture, it's a challenging time right now for men to talk about the role of women, right? They've got to be barefoot pregnant in the kitchen, right? <laughs> I hope you know I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> so here I am as a guy trying to, to teach God's word about the role of women. And when he came to that, pas that part of the passage, I thought... You know, I, I don't want to be standing, talking to the women. I want a more relaxed posture. And so I, I sat down. We, did, we had a stool. We didn't have this nice thing. We just had a stool. And I sat down and I said, let's just sit down together and see and look together in God's word and see what it says about the role of women. And, and I kind of liked it, you know. As a, as, a, as a pastor, God's word deals with all kinds of social and moral issues. And the Bible really gets in our business in some very direct and personal ways in general. And so sometimes as teachers, we have to address things that are challenging, maybe even controversial, perhaps even explosive issues in our culture. And, and so that can be challenging. I don't usually chase after cultural trends. I usually, over the years, have just taught the Bible, particularly going through books of the Bible, but during the whole Black Lives Matter fury, I felt like it was something that I couldn't just ignore, that I needed to talk about. After all, uh, racism and social justice, and I know that that's a term you have to be careful with these days. It's loaded with all kinds of political things. But those things are actually gospel issues. And so I felt like that's something we needed to talk about. And here again, I found myself as a white guy trying to talk about what it means to be black in America. Wow. I am so grateful, profoundly grateful, for Carlotta and Lewis. Lewis, I hope you're out there watching, buddy. Uh, I don't think he's here, but uh, I was so profoundly grateful for Carlotta and Lewis coming up and helping share 
from their personal experience what it means to be black in America. And so sometimes it can be challenging teaching. And so, so I began over the course of time just to kind of like sitting. I'd like to tell you it's because I wanted to be more like Jesus, because the Bible talks about Jesus sitting down to teach, but actually I think I'm just kind of lazy. And so we've already been standing up singing, so if you guys sit down, why can't I sit down? And so this chair represents my style of teaching. And, and my style is very different from Zach's. I want to fill the unforgiving minute with every point, every sub-point, every scripture, every idea, every word I can squeeze into 60 seconds. And I like to kind of sit down. Zach and I are different, aren't we? We think about things differently. We have different personalities. We express things differently. We might even interpret parts of the Bible differently. And that's perfectly okay, isn't it? We're just different. The table and the chair are different from each other. And so both of us are trying to do the same thing, whether at the table or at the chair. We're trying to teach God's word. We're trying to give some kind of warm, motivational speech. We're not giving a TED Talk up here. We're trying to teach God's word and how to live it out. And so the table and the chair are different, but they work together. Now, I, I wouldn't want to put my cup of coffee on the chair, lest I might sit on it. And I wouldn't want to try to sit on the table, <laughs> lest I fall off or probably just break it, right? So these represent the differences. And they also represent, I think, our two congregations. You know, as we've come together as two churches to become one, we're, we're so similar in so many ways, so similar in our beliefs and our values, even in many of our practices, and yet at the same time, we're different from each other in ways. And as we come together, we kind of experience and see these differences as we merge into one new church. And also, a third metaphor that you might draw looking at the table and the chair is as individuals, we're different from each other, aren't we? We're not all the same. We're different shapes, different sizes, different colors. We have different personalities. Some of us are extroverts and some of us are introverts. Uh, we have different educational backgrounds, different jobs, different hobbies, different, different interests, different politics. Even identical twins are different from each other and unique in very subtle ways. And so let me make two observations, is, if I may, about differences in general. First of all, differences are good. Rick Warren once said, if two people are exactly the same, one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> and I think that's exactly true, right? God made each of us unique and different. And speaking of the differences between men and women, when Cindy and I got married right away, I noticed we're different. And I kind of like the ways that we're different. <laughs> So God created us, and he made us, he made us different. Secondly, in general, differences are challenging. They're not easy, are they? Differences lead to misunderstandings, hurt feelings, conflict. You may have noticed we live, are living in a very polarized moment in history, and the world has a great deal of conflict, and a part of that is driven by just the fact that people and groups of people are different from each other. When I was in college, I studied a lot of sociology, and one class I remember they were talking about as they were establishing the United Nations, some of the challenges that emerged when they brought ambassadors from different countries and different cultures together to interface with each other. There was this um, one diplomat from a country that whenever they spoke with someone, they got real close to the person that they were speaking with. And he was talking with a diplomat from another country that had a different kind of personal space. And so he kept backing away. And that first ambassador kept pursuing as he kept backing away. And you might think, well, that's just a funny story. And it is, except it actually led to political conflict between the two countries they represented. So conflict can be challenging. And unfortunately, the Bible is filled with indications that differences between people and groups of people also led to a lot of problems in the early church that you see reflected in the New Testament. The epistles of Paul especially are filled with admonitions and corrections about people trying to work through their differences and simply get along. 
For example, Paul writes to the church in Rome in Romans 14, and he says this, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Boy, wouldn't Paul love to have been here whenever we were wearing masks? <laughs> one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Not, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Do you think Paul was dealing with a church that had some conflict and stress because of people's differences? And then there were individuals who had individual misunderstandings. Paul calls out two women in the church in Philippi when he closes his letter to the church there. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, he says this. Euodia and Syntyche, you belong to the Lord. So I beg you to stop quarreling with each other. How embarrassing to be called out by name and have that recorded in Scripture for all time just because they couldn't get along. And Paul even had his own issues. You recall that he, his mentor, his fellow missionary Barnabas had such a falling out in Acts 15 that they ended up separating and going their own different ways in Acts 15. And so, as our two congregations begin this merger process and we come together as one, do you think we might face some issues? Do you think, or what do you think the odds are, maybe, that I will say something or do something that might offend you or that I might disappoint you in some way? I'd say the odds are pretty high, aren't they? This is why the Bible talks about forgiving one another. Not only are we different, none of us are perfect. And we all say and do things that we shouldn't say and do. And so we need to be forgiving. And then churches can even form cliques. Some might say, well, I'm the table church. I'm the, the chair church. You know, it's nothing new. It doesn't have anything to do with mergers. Just look in the Bible. And you'll see that there were problems with cliques in the church in Corinth. Paul finally had to address it. And he writes in 1 Corinthians 3, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. For he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So what do we learn this morning from the table and the chair? We learn that we're different, and it's good that we're different, but it can be challenging. And so even with their differences, I think the table and the chair actually work together well because you can scoot the, the chair up at the table and you can sit down and enjoy a nice cup of coffee, mm, which is still good. <laughs> Make you envious, huh? So, so they fit together, right? So how as two different congregations coming together as one. How do we make this work? Well, I invite you to look with me at our teaching passage, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, the context is, Paul is addressing one of the biggest challenges and differences between uh, two groups of people that the New Testament church had to face. And that was the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. You remember, the Christian faith began primarily as Jewish Right? It was mostly Jewish believers. But then Gentiles started coming to faith. And they began to wonder, the Jewish Christians who started these churches, well, do these Gentiles need to follow the Old Testament Jewish practices, things like circumcision? And so you might recall the first big church business meeting recorded in Scripture happened in Acts 15 to deal with this very issue. And that also is the passage uh, that we're looking at today, what it is dealing with as we look together in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. If you have that, I'd like to invite you to stand with me as I read our teaching text today. 
I, I like to do that. We don't always do that, but I like to do that. And as we stand and read God's inspired word in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with each other in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace has been given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all obtain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I pray for us. Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture and think about your priority of unity and how the church grows, that you will speak to our hearts from your word in a very clear way this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we could take many weeks unpacking this amazing passage of Scripture, but I want to take the 35,000 high-level view and just look at two things we see in this passage. We see what God has done, and we see what we, in response to, or because of what God has done, what we're to do. So let's begin looking, first of all, at what God has done. And we see two things that God has done. Let's begin in verse 3. And the first thing we see is this. God has made us one. Look at verse 3. It says that we're to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice we are not creating unity. We are maintaining something that God already has created. God is the one who creates unity. We don't seek to build unity. Humans do that usually by looking at how we're alike, right? Do we have the same background? Do we look the same? Do we act the same? Do we have the same social economic status? Do we like the same things? Do we like the same movies? And, and do, we, do we have the same hobbies? You know, I like to hang out at the Olive Bar at Safeway. How about you? you, know? you know, we, we look for those kinds of things. That's not what builds unity, right? And that's not what we do. God has united us in a very profound and substantive way through what he has done in Jesus Christ. And so that is far greater than our trivial differences. Let's look at what he says in verse 4 as he describes how Paul has united us. In verse 4 he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now friends, that is not something that pastors can accomplish. That's not something that elders can lead a church to do. This is the work of God in our hearts. And so God connects us in, in, in seven ways he talks about here. When we come from two different congregations, we now become one body with Christ as the head. Notice what he says. We have, each one of us, the same Holy Spirit in our hearts. We have been called 
to that one hope, the hope of the resurrection in Jesus Christ. We have one Lord who's the true head of this body, and he's the one that we're serving. We have one faith, that is, we share the same Bible. And so we have one faith, one baptism in the name of Jesus, which is in response to our faith. And the same one God who is over all and father of all and through all and in all. This is a very profound and substantive way that God has knit us together in Christ. Now, one of my favorite parks in Issaquah is Confluence Park. I don't know if you've been out there. It's, it's behind the, the dairy plant that's on Front Street to our north. And Confluence Park is one of my favorite parks. I love to prayer walk there. And as you know, confluence means to uh, come together or to flow together into one. And at this park is where the east fork of Issaquah Creek flows into Issaquah Creek proper. Here's a picture of where they uh, flow into each other. It's a little hard to see, but, but coming from the right in, in, in about a 90 degree angle is where the east fork comes into the main uh, creek there. And so they come together. Now I would challenge you to go downstream from where the two creeks come together and look at the water and see if you can tell which water came from which creek. Because when you look at it, it just is a creek, right? It just looks like this. They have become one. And this is exactly what God has done in our lives as followers of Christ in the church. He is the one who brings us together and makes us one. So that's the first thing God has done. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. There's the creek. And you just can't look at it and tell which water came from which creek. It's all one. This is what God has done. But God's done something else too. God not only has made us one, God has made us different. He's made us different from each other. As they say, unity is not uniformity. In fact, God purposely created us each different from each other. And here's the kicker. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, he makes us even more different from other believers in Jesus Christ because he gives us spiritual gifts that are different from one another. This is what Paul is talking about in verse 7. Look with me at verse 7. He says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now he returns, he kind of made an aside there, and he returns to his thought in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. So notice in verse 7, Paul changes. He begins to talk about these unique spiritual gifts that we have. And these are, when he talks about the measure of grace, he's not talking about the amount or volume of God's grace, but the shape of it, that we get different gifts when we come to faith in Christ. You'll notice in verse 6, he's talking about unity, and he keeps repeating the word all, all, all. But then when he comes to verse 7, talking about the unique way the Spirit of God works in each of our hearts, he doesn't say all anymore. Rather, he says to each one of us. He's talking about us individually, uh, not collectively. And so he has given us different kinds of ways we can serve and contribute to the body of Christ, these different spiritual gifts. And so he, he in verse 8, cites Psalm 68, 18. This is a psalm referring to a victorious king who's just won a great victory, and he's handing out the spoils of victory to his men. And, and then he skips to verse 11, if you may, if you will, skip to verse 11, where he talks about the different roles that he brings in the church, so that we each have unique and different distinct ways that we contribute and work together to what God is trying to do. And so, in a sense, you could say this, God adds to our differences in a way that does not subtract from our unity. It's the work. We're, we're, the, we're different, but we are one. It's kind of like this. I don't know if we have any Trekkies. Any of you Trekkies? Not, not too many Trekkies? Okay. No, just a few, right? Well, if you're, if you're aware of Star Trek, particularly in the next generation, you might be familiar with the Borg. And, uh, and, and the Borg is this collective, and, and people get, they get assimilated into the Borg. And they say, you know, resistance is futile. And you're assimilated, and you lose all of your individuality. This is not the kind of unity that God is about. 
The church and the unity in the church is more a mosaic of different personalities and different temperaments and different spiritual gifts and different ways that we speak into what God is doing. That there's this beautiful tapestry and mosaic that he creates by bringing different people together to become one. And so I, I like the quote, be yourself, everyone else is taken. That's what God wants us to be. He, he doesn't want us to, to become uniform like each other. He wants, he wants the table to be the ch- table and the chair to be the chair. And, and because he made us this way, he's made us different. So we bring different strengths to what he's trying to do together as we are one in him. So this is what God has done. He's made us one. He's made us different. Now, what do we do then in response to that? What is our role? And this is the second thing that Paul addresses in this passage. Here's what we are to do. God did two things. We're to do two things. And the first is this. We are to protect the unity that God has created in the church. Look with me back at verse 1. I skipped that. Let's go back to verse 1. He says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So Paul is urging them to live in a manner worthy of God's calling on their life. And and, and that's what verse one calls us to. In verse 2, he defines what that looks like. He gives kind of a list of things to do if you want to live worthy of God's calling in your life. But when you read that list, you'll notice it doesn't include some of the things that you might expect. He doesn't talk about personal holiness. He doesn't talk about faith. Those are critical and important things. What is that list in verse 2? It's a list of how we treat each other, how we relate to each other. Because the focus is what verse 3 is talking about. The focus is about living worthy of the calling by by nurturing the unity that he has created. And and so he talks about how we do this. God cares about our unity. So we're to live with, first of all, humility. Now, if you use social media, you, you recognize right away humility is not valued in our culture today. And let's be honest, it wasn't in Paul's day either. The Romans despised the idea of humility. And so it was always countercultural. Humility means simply that, that, that we see the worth and the value of others. See, I believe every single one of you, why don't you take a minute and just kind of look around. See, just kind of look around, look at someone. Okay, see, see it's all, all of us here? I believe every single one of us is here Because God has called you to be part of his work in this church at this moment. Do we see and value each other in that way? Because it takes a little work for us to get along sometimes. But we have to realize humility sees the value and the worth of others that God has brought in to be a part of his body. If you want more about Humility, you might want to read Philippians 2 sometime when you have a moment. Then he talks about gentleness. And gentleness is simply strength under control. Uh, someone defined humility, in, or excuse me, gentleness in this way. Gentleness is the absence of the disposition to assert personal rights, either in the presence of God or of men. Now just imagine, if we each demand our own way on everything, what do you think that's going to do to the unity of our church? That's what gentleness is. Gentleness is the willingness to to let go of that right to demand it being done your way. And then he talks about patience. I love this word. It means long fuse. Now, as a kid, most kids are downstairs, right? So this is safe. Uh, (laughs) As a kid, um, I became very aware of fuses because what we would do in the 4th of July is we would get firecrackers And we would stand with a firecracker and we would hold it over a bucket of water. And we would light the firecracker. And the trick was to hold it as the fuse burnt down to the last second. So you could drop the firecracker and it would explode underwater. And it made this really cool smoky thing underwater. But if you you let go too soon, the water would put out the fuse and it would never go off. If, uh, yes, I see a... uh, uh, 
<laughs> if you held on too long, <laughs> it would pop before it got in the water. Now, yeah, it's a dumb idea. Don't do that. <laughs> We're lucky that none of us lost any fingers doing that, okay? But here's my point. When he, talk, when he talks here about being patient, the point is this. If we pop too soon with each other, the body of Christ is going to lose some fingers. And he doesn't want that to happen. So we need to be long fused with each other because things are going to happen that, that are going to provoke us. And so we want to be long fused. And then he talks about bearing with one another. God made us all different. And so we, ha we have to tolerate each other's differences. And we just each do things our own different way. So we have to be tolerant of that. And then he talks about love. And here's the thing about love. Love is just not another point on the list. Love defines how you do all those things that we were just looking at. In other words, I don't say, okay, okay, okay. Grudgingly, I'm going to have humility and gentleness and patience, and I'm going to bear with you guys. I don't like doing it. I'm angry about it. I'm resentful, but I've got to do it. That's not the attitude he's talking about. All of these things we do out of a heart of love, like you love your family, like God loves us with that kind of love. And then we come to verse 3, and that's not, an, that's not at all on this list. Verse 3 is the summit, it's the goal, it's the focus, it's the purpose of why do we do these things in verse 2? So that we can maintain the unity in verse 3 that he talks about. And so Paul pivots in verse 3, and he turns and he looks even more at unity and talks about that. But let me just stop and give you, if you will allow me, the condensed, unauthorized, unofficial paraphrase of verses 1 through 3, and it's simply this. Don't be a knucklehead and mess up the unity God has given the church. Okay? That's my paraphrase. Don't be a knucklehead and mess up the unity that God has brought into his church. Then the second thing we're to do is this. Actively contribute to the life of the church. Actively contribute to the life of the church. Paul says that God has gifted each one of us, not just some of us, each one of us in unique ways to serve. Look at verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to, what do they do? They equip the saints. And what do they equip the saints to do? For the work of the ministry. And why is it that every single one who's a part of the body needs to be involved working in the ministry of the church? For building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, there's unity, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he gives these roles in verse 11 that are, are just roles that, that God has brought into the church to equip every single part, person who's a part of the church to serve and work in the ministry of the church. And, and in verse 13 and 14, he describes the spiritual maturity that what that looks like. But let me, for the sake of time, just skip to verse 15. Look with me at verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so each part of the body serves. Uh, you know what the temptation is, I fear, for us at this juncture we're at right now? We're freshly coming together only our second Sunday as a merged church. I think the temptation is this, is to say, other people are here, and so I can sit back and let others do things, right? There's someone else who can teach the kids' class, you know? There's someone else who can do the things that need to be done in the work of the ministry that we have. And we're going to have outreach opportunities in all kinds of ways that, that we're, we're, we, we've been working so hard to go through this merger. I don't know what it was like for, for, for those of you in the Renton campus, but here in Issaquah, it, we spend a lot of time and energy working through this. And the part of me wants to just say, we're done. <sighs> but we're just at the starting line. <laughs> we've just been putting on the cleats and getting ready, and now we're just putting our feet in the starting blocks, and it's just now getting started. And so the real work is before us, and it takes all of us working together, because God didn't bring us together just to be one here in this facility. 
He brought us here to go out into this community, to those in our sphere of influence, and share the gospel and make disciples and followers of Christ, teaching them to obey all that Jesus taught. And so we need each of us. Let me ask you something. Uh, which foot are you ready to get rid of? Which hand do you not need? Which eye are you willing to lose? I mean, you have two of them, right? We want every part of our body to work, don't we? Now, our bodies don't, they don't hold up. They don't all work. <laughs> but we want them to. And that's what Jesus wants from his body, too. He wants each of us to, to be serving and to, and to be a part of what he's doing. And in your uniqueness... The person God gifted you with your personality, your strengths, your background, the spiritual gift the Holy Spirit has brought into your life through faith in Jesus Christ, you have something important to contribute to the work of God's kingdom here. And so even if you're watching online, you can be actively engaged in the work of our church together because it takes all of us. This is why we have this serve sign up sheet right now today as you begin thinking about this Serve Now campaign kind of that uh, we're beginning. I, I really do hope that you won't just pass this off, that you will prayerfully, prayerfully consider how you might serve. Sometimes uh, we have our primary ministry, which is where we're spiritually gifted that we serve in, and then there are also what I call Secondary ministries, Zach, and that's where I say, yeah, sometimes we just, just need someone to help make a pot of coffee, and that doesn't have to be your spiritual gift. <laughs> if you can read instructions, you can do it, <laughs> and so uh, for those of us who like coffee, baby, <laughs> that's important, right? So I want to challenge you to prayerfully think about that. So what do we learn from the table and the chair? We learn that we're different. That's a good thing. But it can be a challenging thing. And they go together. And they work well together. And so we have a role. We don't want to mess up the unity that God has created. And we want to contribute to the work of this church so that we can be healthy and grow. Would you join with me as we pray and ask God's help in this? Father, I thank you for all these wonderful people, each so unique and different that you have brought together to be a part of this wonderful mosaic. And we pray that you will help us to value each other, to protect the unity that you have created, and to contribute to the work you brought us together to do. And so we just ask your Holy Spirit to continue the work. As we praise you, our worship team is coming up now. Father God, we just offer to you as one body praise to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.